Hi, welcome to mini lecture 14 and now we're going to start using the understanding we have of probability and distributions and experiments to start working out some useful things from the data that we can measure. This is going to look at hypothesis testing, covariance and correlation and it's going to look at testing for statistically significant correlation. So now we're going to be using all the stuff we've learned so far to work out useful engineering things. Uh, we're going to start off just by going straight into some examples. You've probably done some of this hypothesis testing before at uh, school or college before you came here. So I'm going to run through a few examples just so that you can get familiar with this part of it. Okay, so this is the first example and it's taken from the Helm booklet. Uh, Helm is help, helping engineers learn mathematics and uh, there's a nice um, set of more than 40 booklets which cover all aspects of uh, the course that we do over the first couple of years here and you'll have been using those I think for the uh, maths diagnostic exercise. So the head of a quality control in a foundry complain, uh, claims that the castings produced in the foundry are better than average and he says this because out of a random sample of 60 castings inspected 59 passed Whereas it's known that the industry um, standard is that 90% of castings would pass. And so do these results support the head of quality controls claim? Obviously 59 out of 60 castings is more than 90%, but is it enough to actually claim with confidence that um, this result um, shows that the uh, foundry is doing better than the average? Okay, that's what we want to assess this time. So I'm going to use my visualizer to help us on this problem. Okay, first of all, our distribution is binomial because we have castings and the casting either is or isn't uh, passing the standard and there are 60 of them and each of them is passing with some probability p. Now for all of the hypothesis testing we do it works by taking two hypotheses one we call the null hypothesis and then um, an alternative hypothesis and we assess the null hypothesis to a certain level of confidence and if it passes then that means that we reject the uh, alternative uh, and if it fails it means we accept the alternative. So here the null hypothesis is that the probability that a casting passes is equal to the industry standard. And so that's saying that P is equal to 0 0.90. If that's true, then the head of quality control is wrong and their output is uh, probably just as good as anywhere else's. Then the alternative hypothesis is that the casting, the probability that the, ca uh, the casting passes the test is greater than the industry standard. And so we could write that, that the probability is greater than 0 0.90. So that's how we formulate the hypotheses that we're going to check. And we note here that this is going to lead to a one-tailed test. Because we're only interested in the event that the probability is greater than that. Um, so that's called a one-tailed test and that's what we're going to look at. Okay, so how are we going to analyze this? Well, let's think about the null hypothesis. We start with the binary, so a binomial distribution, but we can approximate that using a normal distribution because the number of samples is quite high. 
we know that uh, we could find the mean of a binomial distribution, that's equal to NP. And so for the null hypothesis, P is equal to 0.9. So that's equal to 60 times 0.9, which equals 54. And the standard deviation is equal to that result. And those are results that we've seen before in earlier mini lectures. We pop in the values and we get 2.32. So we're representing our binomial distribution approximately as a normal distribution with mean 54 and standard deviation 2.32. Okay, so now that we've represented our null hypothesis like this, we can ask the question that is our evidence that we have 59 out of 60 passing, um, does that put us in the tail of the distribution? So if we look at our distribution, which is now a normal distribution, something like that, If we're looking at a 5% confidence interval, we are asking ourselves, is our result in the main part of the distribution or is it in the tail here? And if it's in the tail, that means that the hypothesis is probably not true and we can reject it. So where is 59 on that? Well, we use the uh, standardized distribution um, because we have the tabulated values for that. So for the standardized distribution, this has a mean zero and the value of Z, the critical value of Z for 5% is 11.5. Six four five, and now we want to find out what the z is for our result. Now z is the transformation of one normal distribution to the standardized normal distribution, which we've again done in mini lectures previously, and we use the result where we subtract uh, from our value the mean and divide it by the standard deviation. And that equals 1.94. Now we notice something interesting here. Here we've used 58.5 and our question is, is a value of 59, which is the result out of 60 in the tail. So obviously we've made a difference there. Now this is because Our original distribution is binomial, so it's discrete, um, and that's 59. But we've turned it into a, an approximation, which is a continuous distribution. And so we have to recognize now that actually anything that's greater than 58.5 would be included within 59 uh, in our approximation. So we need to use that value to, to do that uh, correctly. Okay, so we've got our Z value, and look where it is. It's 1.94, and so that's going to be up here somewhere. So we notice that 1.94 is greater than our critical value of Z, which was 1.645 at our uh, at our 95% um, confidence interval confidence criterion um, and so that means that we can reject the hypothesis this is uh, significant uh, the different and so we reject 
H0. The probability that this occurrence is um, is uh, is more than uh, well, sorry, is, uh, less than five percent likely, given what we know. And so, if we're rejecting H naught, that means that H one is accepted. H one becomes accepted, and so that means that the claim is justified. So, good news for the foundry. Okay, so now we've got a second example, which is a little different. So in the second example, we have a factory with a powder dispensing stage. Dishwasher powder is poured into cartons um, in which it's sold by an automatic dispensing machine which is set to dispense three kilos of powder into each carton. So your job is you're an engineer looking at this and you have to check that it's performing adequately or whether it needs some work doing to it. So in order to check that you take samples, uh, you take 40 random samples and weigh them. And you find that the mean of those samples is 3.005 kilos. So it's a bit different from what you want it to be. You want it to be three kilos. And we know from past knowledge of the process that the dispensing machine operates with a variance of 0.1, sorry, 0.0152 kilograms squared. And the manufacturer is willing to rely on a 5% level of significance um, for the decision. So does this sample provide the engineer with enough evidence that the true mean is not three kilos, uh, in which case the machine does require adjustment? So we'll work through this one. So the null hypothesis is that the mean is indeed three kilos, whereas the alternative hypothesis is that the mean is not equal to three kilos. So now this is going to be a two-tailed test. Because it could be um, either side of that condition. If we looked at the distribution, any occurrences within the main part of the distribution are suggesting that um, the null hypothesis is true and that uh, there's no significant difference in the mean. But if our results lie in either of these two tails, it tells us that there is a significant difference. So each of these tails is 2.5%, such that the uh, overall confidence is 5%, uh, the overall level of significance is 5%. And so then you can find your critical value of Z from a uh, set of tables. So I'll illustrate that. So here we have some tables of normal distributions. So we're looking for 2.5% in our tail. So probability 2.5% is here. And so the value on the x-axis there is 1.96. Okay, so that's where we get that from. Z critical is equal to 1.96. Okay, so that's the uh, hypothesis. And now we can calculate the actual value of Z using the data that we've measured. So Z is equal to the mean 
divided by the standard error of uh, the measurements which we've uh, defined previously as well. Okay, the mean that was measured was 3.005. The mean that's wanted, or we're hypothesizing that the mean is uh, 3, is that the mean of the actual population. And our standard error is, so we're given the standard deviation for the process in the question, and we've got 40 samples. So we can do that. And we work that out, we get 2 points. And so we can see that 2.108 is indeed greater than our critical value of Z, and so therefore H0 is rejected. And so what that means is that the um, machine, the average amount being dispensed by the machine, is probably. Um, significantly different than 3 kilos with a significance level of 5%. And so that means that the machine does need adjustment. Because it falls outside the quality control set by the, um, by the company. So in this case, we did the calculation, and we did it with a value of standard deviation, which we knew, and that's the standard deviation of the population, not of the samples that were measured. That's a known standard deviation that comes out of that process. And it's possible you could have a value for that. Perhaps over the years, you've accumulated a huge number of measurements from the process, and it has consistently had um, a constant uh, standard deviation that you can calculate. You've got a large enough number of measurements to, to get a reasonable uh, representative value of what the actual population standard deviation is. But often you won't have that value. Um, so what do you do in that case? So if sigma is unknown, what can you do? Uh, well, of course, we have our estimate for it. So our estimate of the standard deviation we can calculate from our samples sn minus 1 that's the non-biased uh, standard deviation that we can calculate from our samples uh, and it's fine to use that but we have to use a different distribution we now have t as our variable and we write our equation like that so Instead of using Z for the normal distribution, now we're going to use a T distribution. And the T distribution is a little different because it has degrees of freedom within it. Um, and we have n samples we're going to have n minus one degrees of freedom if you want to learn more about what that means you can look at the helm workbooks and they explain that nicely so to just take a look at what that will look like this is a t distribution in my tables and data so the t distribution is symmetrical so we just need to get uh, 2.5% for the 5% level of significance. We need 2.5% in each tail in this case. So then we're looking for the probability 2.5. Just trying to focus that. 2.5 is there. Uh, and then we've got this thing here, V, which is the number of degrees of freedom. So we need to go down to, we're at 31, where well, we've got 30 and 32 tabulated, and 2.5. So you go down here and you'd see this is where our number comes from, 2.042 to 2.037. And then you can uh, interpolate between those two to get the value for, sorry, uh, that's 31. We're at 39, um, 40 minus 1, 39, so we're here. So we're between um, 
2.024 and 2.021. So that's the value that we'd uh, extract from that. Okay, so we've done two examples there, which are probably somewhat familiar to you. Um, if not, there's loads of more uh, information about that, like I said, in the Helm workbooks. Um, so we've seen uh, two cases there, uh, and in statistics, there's lots of different combinations of um, circumstance, uh, and then you end up having different tests for um, each one. And we're not uh, in the business here proving all these distributions uh, or understanding the detail of all the tests um, and why you use them. Um, but we're trying to equip you with the uh, skills to navigate around it. So this table is useful. Um, it tells us um, what test you would use for different situations. So if your population is normal, then you've got the case of is the variance known or unknown. And then you have cases of your sample size small or large. Um, then this can lead to different situations. So in the last instance, we had a normal population, but we didn't know the variance. Um, and the sample size was quite small uh, with uh, 40 samples. And so that's why we had to use the t-test. Um, but if we had more and more samples, then we'd find that z actually um, starts, the, the normal approximation with z starts to approximate that uh, reasonably well. Okay, so the next question we've got is, what if we have two samples? Uh, those examples are just for one sample and uh, inferring some, inf some uh, information about that, making decisions from it. Now we have two samples. We're gonna assume that they're both normally distributed and we're going to assume that each has a known variance. Um, so we've got two samples with two means and we want to be able to um, investigate them. So, for example, this could be um, like uh, with our first example in the whole lecture course, we had uh, some metal testing and perhaps you have um, uh, two types of metal and you've done the test on both of them. You've got data for the strength of both of them and you want to decide whether or not they're actually, one's actually stronger than the other. So how do we assess that? Well, we can take the two sets of data take the two means that we know and subtract one from the other. So this is our null hypothesis that the difference between the means of the two samples is equal to some value. And typically that value is going to be zero. So if we're asking the question, um, are these two samples from the different materials, are they basically the same? Then we would say, is the mean of the two samples uh, is the difference between the mean of the two samples, is that equal to zero? So that's the null hypothesis that we test. And we have some results that um, we've uh, seen from previously in the course. Um, the expectation if you subtract one mean from another mean is equal to the um, difference between the expectations of each mean and that's equal to mu1 minus mu2. And similarly for the variance, so that's the uh, properties um, of uh, two distributions when you combine them together, uh, which we've looked at before. Um, and so now you do the transformation to get it into the um, form of the uh, z value. So now it's a normal distribution of mean zero, standard deviation one, and here's our mean of the samples subtracted by the difference in the, uh, or the mean of the uh, combined distribution divided by the standard deviation of the combined distribution. So that's a general result that we can use to compare two set populations, two, sorry, two samples, and to decide whether they're probably from the same population or from two different populations. So here's an example what you can look at to uh, put that into practice. 
So a motor manufacturer wishes to replace a steel suspension component by aluminium components to save weight and improve uh, performance. Uh, tensile strength tests are carried out on ra randomly chosen samples of two possible components before a final choice is made. And we're given that data, so we've got component one, component two, different sample sizes of 15 and 10. And we've got a tensile strength of 90 for one of them, a mean tensile strength of 90, and a mean of 88 for the other. And the standard deviation is given as 2.3 and 2.2. So we want to know, is there a difference in the measured tensile strengths at the 5% level of significance? So is there any difference between these effectively? Are they, if you had a, um, a single population and took these random samples from it, um, is it uh, likely that you'd get this um, two samples with this difference or is it unlikely at the 5% level of significance? So that's what we want to look at this time. So I'll use the visualizer again to work through that example. So our null hypothesis is that the difference of the two means from the populations that our samples came from is equal to zero. And our alternative hypothesis is that the difference of the means from the two populations that the samples came from is not equal to zero. So again, this is going to be two-tailed. And so again, our z-critical going to be equal to 1.96. So now, we're, as we've done before, we calculate our Z parameter. So that's the difference between the means divided uh, minus the difference between the population means divided by the new standard deviation. And we pop in our values, so it's 90 minus 88. Our hypothesis that we're testing is that those two population means are the same, so that's zero. And then we've got our combined standard error at the bottom. And you work that out and you get 2.186. So we see that 2.186 uh, is indeed greater than 1.96. And so on that basis, we can reject H0 and conclude that there is a difference in strength. but uh, only just, that's only a little bit larger than that. And we've done this at the 5% level of significance. Now, if you're making um, engines and you want to ensure that you're meeting your quality uh, standards, then perhaps you want to do uh, a bit better than that. Maybe you want to be more than 5% confident um, that uh, this other material is going to be performing better. So. To do that, you might do more tests. So rather than having 15 and 10 samples, increase that number, or perhaps you would um, repeat the test at a different level of significance. Okay, so the next part of this lecture is about covariance and correlation. So again, we're going to work out some things from data and Rather than just looking at uh, two samples and or one sample and working things out from it, now we've got um, relationships between two variables. Now that's what we're looking at. So we've got two sets of data and we're asking the question, are they related to each other or are they independent from each other? So we've got X's and we've got Y's. So to do this, the first thing we do is we check the unbiased covariance. 
A covariant is about how does uh, how do these variables um, change in relation to each other. This is the definition of it. You'd have seen that before, I think. And uh, we can just uh, rearrange that with some algebra if we want to and write it out like this. Uh, the trouble with the covariance is that it's got units. We've got these x's and y's multiplied together. Um, so the covariance is going to have um, dimensions um, and it's hard to compare one covariance to another because each one will be different depending on what units are used. And so we use the correlation coefficient instead and the correlation coefficient is the covariance and it's normalized by the product of the standard deviations. And then that generalizes it so it's now dimensionless and this has a range from minus one to plus one. Uh, if it's minus one, then there's a negative correlation. If it's plus one, there's a positive correlation. And if it's zero, there's no correlation. So thinking about the covariance, if we're taking some point, the mean x and the mean y, and that's the mean x and the mean y, and we're looking at our data points, xi, yi, and looking, well, how does this data point move compared to the mean? Now, if when we move to the left in X, if we always tend to be moving down in Y as well, then the signs of these are going to tend to be um, correlated. They're going to tend to be the same. But if it doesn't happen like that, if when we move to the left, it uh, makes no difference to whether we're moving up or down on Y. Likewise, if we move X to the right, it makes no difference whether we move up or down on the Y. Then you're just as likely to get a positive value here as we are a negative value here and vice versa and so then when we take the products and sum them up if there's no correlation this is going to tend to sum to zero because the pluses and the minuses will cancel each other out however if there is some correlation either positive or negative there's going to be tend there's going to tend to be some uh, tendency for negatives and negatives to happen at the same time or positives and positives to happen at the same time and then when you uh, take the products and sum them all up then you get a value, either the positive or the negative value. So that's why the covariance tells us about whether there's a correlation or not. And you know that uh, a posi positive correlation looks like that, negative correlation looks like that, and there's no correlation there. So uh, I think you've met all this before. Uh, and the correlation coefficient um, gives us some information about that. You know, it's minus one to one. Uh, so it tells us something about whether there's a correlation or not. But uh, how do we know if there's a statistically significant correlation going on? So again, we can apply our hypothesis testing to this. So if we have a calculated value of the correlation coefficient, we want to know um, is that statistically significant for the given data that we've got. So again, we take the case, the null hypothesis H0, H0 where we say there is no relationship between them and H1 where um, there is some relationship between them. Uh, where rho is the true value of the population correlation. So we know that our value of r is somewhere between minus one and one, and we wish to know whether our correlation is significantly different to zero. So that's how we can set our test up. Now to do this test, we have to use a new test statistic. We call it our test. It's equal to the modulus of r multiplied by square root of n minus 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus r squared. I'm not going to prove this, but you can find out more about it in uh, the Helm booklet or in textbooks. And with this, we're going to use a t distribution to assess um, that statistic. And we use the t distribution with n minus 2 degrees of freedom in this case. This is really useful, so not only can we calculate R, R sort of tells us whether it looks like there's a correlation or not, but now we can actually test that um, to a degree of uh, significance. Okay, so here's an example, again it's taken from a Helm booklet, and we've taken seven torque values from an electric motor and it's using some current, so we're looking at how the torque relates to the current. And if we plot that, it turns out like this, we have our X, we have our Y, and here's our data, looking at it, is there a correlation there? Well, it kind of looks like there might be, 
If we calculate our covariance, there's a positive value there. And if we calculate then the um, coefficient of correlation, it comes out at 0.464. So, you know, it's between minus 1 and 1 is not 0. Um, suggesting there might be a correlation. It's not very close to one either, but how do we judge that? That's what we're trying to do here. Um, we notice that uh, we've got this sort of 1 divided by n minus 1 term. You recognize that as what we were using when we were calculating non-biased standard deviations earlier on in the module. Um, now when you calculate the covariance, you can calculate again a non-biased version or a biased version. Uh, it doesn't actually matter in this case which we use, as long as we use the same uh, type uh, for both the covariance and for the standard deviations that we've calculated um, for our data. So if you're using n minus 1 here, use the n minus 1 version of the standard deviation. If you use the biased versions for both of them, we get the same number here. They cancel each other out. Okay, so now we want to apply our test. First of all, you calculate your R test value and you put in your numbers. We've got 1.17. And we're looking for a T distribution. Uh, it's two sided because the correlation coefficient R could be either greater than zero or less than zero. Um, and we're looking at it at the 5% significance level. So we want to find our critical value. Okay, so let's try and do that. Check we can do that. I'll turn the visualizer on. Here we go. So it's two-sided, 5% significance level. So we're looking at the 2.5% here, 2.5% in each tail. And how many degrees of freedom are there? Um, so the degrees of freedom. Uh, there we go, just trying to show you this again. Uh, so n minus 2 degrees of freedom, that's what we're looking for. So we've got our tabulated data, 2.5 n minus 2. Um, we've got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 data points, so we've got n minus 2 is 5. So we get 2.571 as our critical value. And that's what we've got here, 2.571. So in this case, our test value, 1.17, is less than the critical value. And so that means that uh, with the data we have, it lies within um, the likely probability range. And so we cannot reject the null hypothesis. So with this data and with this test, it tells us that um, we can't reject the null hypothesis. So we're not more than, uh, um, 95% confident that there's uh, any sort of relationship in this data. Uh, so looks can be deceiving here. Um, essentially, maybe there is a correlation, but it's weak. Uh, the R value there is is uh, not so close to one. And so if you wanted to confirm that there is an actual correlation, you would need a lot more data points, get more data, and that will enable this um, test to um, perhaps be conclusive one way or the other, if you still believe that there should be some correlation there. So in this case, there's no evidence of a relationship between torque and current. Okay, so there we go. So we've done uh, some nice testing there. We've used the types of data that we've looked at throughout the course, how we can measure it, how we can then characterize the data with a mean and a variance, for example, um, and how we can use that data now to make decisions about processes or make decisions about what materials we're going to use. So the next lecture is going to introduce the uh, idea of the maximum likelihood uh, estimation. Uh, you'd have seen this to some degree before.
Uh, we're going to do linear regression, but we're going to prove why ordinary least squares is a good way to, or a, the, the way to fit um, parameters. And we're going to look at the coefficient of determination, which will help to tell us whether or not our fit is good. And we'll look at the significance um, testing for regression.